Today, we're going to be talking about the five most common myths I see about aerodynamics on race cars. Now, I see these all over the internet. A lot of them pop up in my comments all the time, and I just sort of see them around. Uh, so I thought I'd just run through some of these and sort of debunk some of these myths and show you what's the actual case. Now, the first one I see is that performance uh, on race car aerodynamic devices comes from the pressure side. And this is something where a lot of people, when they talk about things like front splitters, and they often get talking about how the, the length of the front splitter that generates a lot of pressure on the top surface, and that's where the performance comes from, or even things like wings, where they, they think that the pressure on the top side is what gives them performance. But in actual fact, uh, this is very far from the truth. Uh, the majority of where we see performance gains on race cars comes from the suction side, undersides of wings, undersides of splitters, things like that. Perhaps the easiest demonstration of this is to look at the pressure coefficient around a wing. Uh, you can see that the suction on the suction side is of a far greater magnitude than the pressure on the pressure side. And there's also a, a theoretical cap on the coefficient of pressure on the pressure side of one. On the suction side, we can get it very, very negative. So as a result, when you're designing something like a race car, you'll focus all your efforts on making sure the suction side is really nice. And within reason, you don't have to worry too much about the pressure side. Now, the second myth I see, and this is a really common one, is that aerodynamics on race cars are speed sensitive. Now, one of the most common ways I see this saying is like this wing works at any speed or this wing stalls at this speed or something like that. Um, a lot of people discuss this on the Internet and for the purposes of race cars, it's largely untrue. When you have a look at something like an aircraft, I feel like this is where this myth came from. As you slow down the aircraft, you have less and less lift force available from reduced aero forces from reduced speed. So you have to increase the angle of attack of the aircraft more and more and more. This means you have something known as a stall speed, which is basically where your aircraft will get to a certain speed. It will hit the peak angle of attack where the airfoil will stall because it needs to be there to generate the lift to keep it in the sky. And then it will stall. It won't generate any more lift and it will drop out of the sky. This is not the case on a race car because largely our angles of attack of our aerodynamics devices are fixed. Now, I say it's not speed sensitive. There's two things that really need to be considered. One is the condition sensitivity. And this is what I think people sometimes get confused with and sometimes just ignore. Um, but race car aerodynamic devices are very condition sensitive in terms of ride height, crosswind, roll, things like that. And so as a result, if you think about it, as the car gets faster and faster and faster, uh, the ride heights of the car will change as the downforce pushes the car into the ground. So you do get a speed sensitivity as such from that effect because as you go faster, ride height lowers, you will get different aerodynamic effects. But it's not a true speed sensitivity. Of course, the other thing to consider is something known as Reynolds effects. Um, Reynolds effects do exist on a race car, basically changing the, the thickness of the boundary layers. Um, they aren't as big a factor as I think most people think they are. They're not night and day difference, even across a pretty wide range of speeds. Um, the main difference is that as your speeds start to go up, your boundary layers will start to get thinner. The transition to turbulence will be earlier. Uh, generally speaking, you'll end up with a, a, the ability of a wing to hold on for much longer. Um, but in general, speed sensitivity of aerodynamics of race cars in a fish, fixed condition is not that high. Uh, but the condition sensitivity of devices on race cars is high. The third area myth I see on race cars, and maybe this is more of a, a design flaw than it is a myth, uh, is, is that sharp leading edges are an appropriate choice um, on any aerodynamic device. Now, this is really quite bad. You do see this quite often, and I appreciate that some things like canards need a degree of a sharp edge, but we never actually want a sharp leading edge on a device. There's two main reasons to this. Uh, one is, is that if you have a sharp edge, um, and you have a flow coming down, what you end up with is a really, really high pressure peak, or I should say low pressure peak, because there'll be a lot of suction. Um, so basically you'll have your, your flat surface like this, your sharp edge. If you're generating some degree of suction down here, let's say it's effectively an angle to the airflow, the airflow will come down, and then it has to try and curve around this really rapid transition, um, which means that the most likely thing that's going to happen is it's just going to separate off the front or if you end up with a really sharp peak uh, in terms of suction peak there, 
um, you end up with a really strong adverse pressure gradient. Now, you can watch my video on adverse pressure gradient as to why that's a bad idea, but that's something that encourages your boundary layer to thicken and your, your area device to separate earlier, which is not a very good idea. The other thing that you have is that even if you have a sharp edge device that you've aligned to the airflow, so the airflow comes in nice down and then, then continues off, the problem is, is that, like I spoke earlier, race cars are in a lot of different conditions and they have high condition sensitivity. As conditions change, uh, your onset flow onto your sharp edge changes and therefore you can end up with rapidly inducing pressure peaks as you change ride height, as you change crosswind, things like that, um, which generally speaking is going to make your car more condition sensitive, which is not something that you want from a driving perspective. There are of course valid places to put sharp edges on aero devices. Uh, the trailing edge you want to have pretty much as sharp as physically possible. Uh, and shedding edges, generally speaking, you want to have them pretty sharp as well. So edges off the side where vortices are shed. Um, but for leading edges, we want them curved. The fourth myth is that bigger for diffusers is always better. Um, now this is, is an interesting one to discuss because I think it would be completely wrong to say that a larger volume diffuser isn't a better thing on its own. Uh, but a trend that I see with a lot of things like time attack cars in particular um, and homebrew diffusers on those is that people are just trying to make them as big as physically possible. And while you can have a very well-designed large exit diffuser, and there's plenty of good ones out there, it's not immediately the first thing you want to go for. And there's a few main reasons. Now, obviously the, the first one is, is that if you have a really, really big diffuser with a really aggressive kick or, or aggressive curvature, you will get flow separation on the diffuser, particularly at low ride heights. Um, and that's not good. But I'm going to assume for the sake of this that the diffuser is attached and you're doing your, your surface visualization with flow vis or tufts and you think that it's all good and dandy. There's two big problems. One is that as you make the diffuser volume higher and you increase the roof height from the roof of the diffuser to the ground plane, you're reducing the induced suction from the edge vortices and straight vortices of the diffuser on the diffuser roof. So you're losing performance with respect to that. Now, obviously, the, the larger volume can help balance that out, but this is something that you're going to lose out. Um, and a correctly designed diffuser can compensate for this, but often I see really big diffusers that are not correctly designed. The other big factor that, that isn't discussed so much is that as you get a much larger diffuser, you may maintain a surface flow attachment, and so you'll look good on flow vis. But what you may also be doing is blowing up your diffuser vortices. So whether that's the edge vortices or the straight vortices, you can overexpand those or you can overexpand any losses in the, in the flow energy from further upstream. And as you expand those, they become much larger. They effectively act as blockage and your diffuser area actually isn't any bigger than a smaller diffuser where those were all intact. So basically, if you were blowing your vortices up, um, that would mean that your large diffuser's performance is no better than a small diffuser. Unfortunately, this is a notoriously difficult thing to visualize. Uh, so you're best off if you don't have proper analysis tools going for something conservative rather than just going for the biggest thing you can physically fit on the car. The fifth error myth is, is that adding more elements is always better. Uh, now I can understand why people would be really confused on this one uh, because obviously high performance uh, race cars like Formula One cars have 50 bajillion elements. Um, and they'd add more elements in lots of places if they could. And even my, I myself have commented on some systems that need more elements in them. But the thing is, is that adding elements comes at a price. And if you imagine you have a single element airfoil with a fixed leading edge and a fixed trailing edge position, if you took that and then slotted that into two elements, keeping the same fixed leading edge and trailing edge position, you've essentially backed off the airfoil. You've added a slot in the middle of it. You've still got the same overall um, leading edge to trailing edge, assuming that we're running roughly the same overall camber, you're going to lose load for adding that slot in. Basically, making it into more elements depowers it. Um, so if you have something that is nice and attached, you probably want to keep it single element. You wouldn't want to increase the number of elements. Now, obviously, multiple elements have a time and a place. Otherwise, we wouldn't use them, uh, particularly uh, when we're trying to keep airflow attached on a very steep uh, wing or if we've got something where we're trying to, to minimize ground sensitivity and increase the sort of porosity through the system, um, there are examples of where multi-elements are good. But for a lot of your run-of-the-mill cases, you're actually better off with something like a single element wing unless you're trying to push the system really hard. So there you have it. Those are my five top error myths that I see on the internet. If you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more. And leave a comment below uh, if you have any video ideas on what you'd like to see next. Thanks for watching and hopefully 
See you next time.